Somebody's seen him work. Come on, choir, Contessa. She's seen him work. Have you seen him work? I'm just checking. Good to be here this morning with everybody. Happy 43 years. Happy 43 years. Happy 43 years. Happy 43 years. Um, it's an honor to have an opportunity to share uh, with you once again this morning. Uh, it seems like yesterday I was up here, so I can't imagine every week. This is turnover is fast. But uh, I'm excited again to have the opportunity to share what God has been teaching me in my own life. And what I try to do uh, when I share God's word is uh, make it simple for myself and just be in his word. And so that I can just share um, out of an overflow of what God is teaching me in my own devotions, in my own uh, study and time with God. And so I want to share with you uh, some of my overflow, if that's okay. That's okay to share with you some of my overflow. So I want you to stand with me so we can read God's word. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 20 through 25. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 20 through 25. Verse 20 says, When your sons ask in the time to come, saying, what do the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments mean, which the Lord our God commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us from Egypt with a mighty hand. Moreover, the Lord showed great and distressing signs and wonders before our eyes against Egypt and Pharaoh and all his household. He brought us out from there in order to bring us in, to give us the land which he had sworn to our fathers. So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival as it is today. It will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all the commandments before the Lord our God, just as he commanded us. You may be seated. Today, briefly, I want to talk to you about the answer for every generation. There's a question that's being asked. It says, the sons will ask in the time to come. That simply means that there's a time that's coming that the sons will ask. There's some, there's some folks that are coming and they're going to they're gonna have a question. And the question is, what does it mean, the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments? What, what does it mean? Not what does it say. I understand what it says. I want to know what it means. I want to know the benefits and outcomes, the reasons. What, what is it there for? I need to understand what does it mean, the testimonies, the statutes, and the judgments. And that question would come to the people of Israel because they were under the Mosaic law. They were under the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy chapter 5 rehearses the Ten Commandments that Exodus 20 gives. And so it's going over the Ten Commandments and, and how you're supposed to obey God based on these Ten Commandments. So that would be an appropriate question to what, what does it mean, the judgments and the statutes. But I want you to understand the question. It's really the same question we would ask now. And that is, what does it mean to live your life under the rule of God? Because either way, it's still living under the rule of God. Whether it's the Ten Commandments and doing it based on a law motivation or doing it based on a grace motivation, either way, we're supposed to submit ourselves to the rule of God. And so he's asking, what does it mean? Uh, that's a future question that's coming. And then it says, what you shall say to them when the question comes. In other words, there is a pre-prescribed answer that's already given no matter when the question comes. So I don't care if the question comes in the promised land, which I perceive that's probably when it came, based on Judges chapter 2, verse 7, which says, all the days of Joshua, the people served the Lord. So because of that lifestyle, it would prompt the question. Or if the question comes later on or in the New Testament, it doesn't matter when the question comes because we already have a pre-prescribed answer to the question. 
That means for all generations, there is an answer that's given right here to the question that many of us have in different ways. Well, what does it mean to give my life totally to God? I mean, I've done it halfway, but what does it mean to do it all the way? I mean, I've done it some of the way, but what does it mean to give my life fully? Not just some of my life, but all of my life. You say, well, this is Old Testament. No, no, this is, this is the Testaments. The rule of God, that question, what does it mean to live your life under the rule of God? And it says, I love the answer, this is what you shall say. This is the answer that some of us need today. Is you and I, we used to be slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. But God brought us out with a mighty hand. I saw it for myself. He showed great wonders and signs to bring me out. And he brought me out in order to bring me in to a promise that he has for my life. So he has commanded me to obey him for my good and my survival as it is right now. So it's only righteousness for me to obey him in everything that he has called me to do. Do you, do you hear the answer? I, don't, I think... I don't really have to preach that long. My dad will be mad at me if I walk off too fast. But I feel like the Bible preaches itself. Sometimes I'm wondering, why do I need to, I mean, just read it. It just, it kind of tells you as you go down, but maybe you didn't hear it. Let me go back up. It's only right for me to obey God. Because it's for my survival and my good. God has given me a promise. He brought me into my promise out of a mess. And how he brought me out was because of his mighty hand. And you want to know what the meaning is of me obeying God? In other words, God is the one who has my life. God is the one who has my promise. God is the one who has my survival. God is the one who has my good. God is the one who has my peace. God is the one who owns my joy. God is the one who owns my tomorrow. God is the one who owns my marriage. God is the one who owns my finances. God is the one, God is the one who owns it all. So it's only right for me to give my life to God. Somebody up in here better give your life to God. You know why? Because God has your life. To give your life to anything else is only to become enslaved to something that ain't got nothing for you. I don't care if you a baby boomer, millennial, exennial, generation A, B, C, D, E, F. I don't care who you are. You better give your life to God because God has your life. To give your life to anything else is only to become enslaved to something that ain't got nothing for you. I'm done. I don't know what else to say to you. you it, it just told you that the answer to the question is to give your life to God. Because God is the one who owns it all. And we want to waste our time pedaling around trying to switch from a mighty hand to our hand to try to figure out how to work things out. Your mighty hand can't do anything because your hand ain't that mighty. I mean, he's given the answer. I got to keep preaching because my dad's going to make me, but I'm just letting you know that the answer is clear. He's saying that you have to give your life to God. You're saying, Jonathan, wait a minute. I, that's the Mosaic law. They were under the law. You can't really preach that to us today in modern times because we're not under the Mosaic law. You don't understand. That's why James 1.25, which is in the New Testament, says, if you look at my perfect law and abide by it, the law of liberty, it will set you free. You will be able to do what I have called you to do. You will be able to be blessed in whatever you do. That's what the Bible says in the New Testament. It even talks about your survival being on God's word. In Matthew 7, it says there's a man who built his house on a rock and a man who built his house on sand and there was storms that came through. But after the storm, there was only one house that stood, both of them built, but only one house stood, and that was the one that was resting on the Word of God. It's for your survival. 
It's not just Old Testament, it's New Testament living under his rule. James 1.22, it even says that don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word, lest you delude your life. It's, just, it's letting you know over and over again. Uh, Luke 11, uh, 28 even says that you will be blessed if you hear my word, but not only that, if you keep my word. John 8, 31 and 32 says you, you, you have to abide in my word, and if you abide in my word, you will become my disciples. And if you become my disciples, you'll realize that it is my word that sets you free. So you can't come to me talking about, well, I'm Generation Z. I could care less who you are. You better submit your life to God. So we're playing a different half, but you're still playing the same exact game. Because you went from the Mosaic law, but God never abolished his law. He just came to fulfill the law. So in Jeremiah 31, he was nice enough and gracious enough to do a new covenant because of old failures and just write the law on your heart so that he can remember your sins no more. That's just because of how great God is. But it's, it's a different half, but it's still the same exact game. People want to know, well, I mean, how did we make it to 43 years? I ain't got no magic tricks for you. Tony Evans and Lois Evans submitted their lives to God. People want to ask questions about, well, how is it that he has four kids in ministry and all of those different things? It's because he told us, y'all going to live a crazy life if you don't submit your life to God. Two Daddy even told me, he said, in, in his Two Daddy voice, he said, uh, Jonathan, what are you doing with your life, son? He said, what are you doing? He said, why are you trying to make a way when God has already made a way? You're wasting your time. You can't make your own way. You, you're too dumb to make your own way. That's what Two Daddy would say. He'd make you feel like a fool for trying to walk in the opposition to God. And some of us want to know, how do we get uh, from one year of turbulent marriage to a successful 10 years? Each side, the woman and the man, has to submit their marriage to God. You have to submit your roles to God. You have to go find out what God says. Because You know why? Because he created it. You can't do it your own. You can't make your own way. And people, a woman will say, well, I'm trying to submit my life to God, but my husband is out of line. Will you do what Priscilla did in the war room and you go to your prayer closet and you pray for your husband and then you continue to submit your life to God, which means you will remain a wife as unto God. See, sometimes you're looking at your husband. You're supposed to be a wife unto God and lead by example based on 1 Peter 3 so that by not your words, but by your example, he he is eventually changed by the mighty hand of God that came and got your tail in the past. <laughs> because you got to believe that the same mighty hand that came after you is the same mighty hand that can change him. You can't do it though. No matter how much you say to him or no matter how much you try to change things or manipulate things, it can't come from you. The whole Bible is about a lot of things, but one of the things is him trying to take responsibility. But we won't give it to him. He says, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know what that means? You can't give you rest. That's what that means. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you know it. What does it say? Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not. Please. Don't do that. You know why? Because I am going to make your path straight. You know what that means? You can't make your path straight. 
that also lets you know that your path is crooked. The verses are outing us. And so what we do is we, we try to continue to do these things on our own and, and, and it doesn't work that way. They're saying in Deuteronomy 6 and he's saying all over the New Testament is that I have the mighty hand that saves. And not only do I have the mighty hand that saves you for a future land, but it saves you in your present land. That's why it says in James 1.21, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. It's able to save your soul, but you have to receive the word. So you can be saved and not saved. Some of y'all are like, mm-mm. Yeah, trust me. You can be saved for tomorrow and feel like you're in bondage today. Why? Because it has to do with submitting your life to the rule of God. It's a different half, but people, we are playing the same exact game. You can't use grace as an excuse to walk in sin and then get mad that you're not having an experience with God. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who have died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ have been baptized into his death? Therefore, you and I have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised to the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. And so, it's simple. I'm, I got to keep going because he, he's. <laughs> but I, I struggled with this passage because after I studied it, I was like, I can't really talk about this that long. I, I don't know what he wants me to say. I mean, submit your life to God, like all of it. I mean, he's saying, he's saying the answer is, you know, the, the question that's coming, what does it mean? We have this answer, but that question, what does it mean to submit your life to God? It means your survival. Survival connotates that things won't be perfect, storms will come, but you will stand. It, it means you're good. There, there is a promise that he had promised to their fathers there's a land here right now in Deuteronomy 6. They're about three or four weeks away from crossing over. They're, they're, they're on the cusp of a promise, and some of us are on the cusp. And, and you're getting tired. Don't grow weary of doing good because you're only three weeks away. You're, you're on the cusp of something showing up for you, that, the promise that God has for you. That's why the Bible says continue in the way. Because God has your life. And if you, if you leave God's hand to do it your own way, you just became a slave to something else. So, so you can either use freedom to go be a slave or you can choose to become a slave so that you can be free. Those are your only options. You can use freedom. Somebody says, say it again, so okay. You can use freedom and you end up being a slave because you thought your hand could do it. Or you can say, you know what? Somebody knows a little bit better than me. I'm gonna go be a slave. And then you'll wake up and realize, oh, now I'm free. Because who the sun sets free is free indeed. I mean, it's a different testament, but we still talk in the same exact game. It's an answer for every generation. You know, my mom is a great cook. Can't wait to talk about her when she gets here. Uh, She's a great cook. One of the things that I love, I mean, as, as time has gone and the family has grown, she doesn't cook the whole meal herself anymore, okay? She gets other people to bring stuff over the house, but there's a few dishes that we don't allow. <laughs> don't bring none of your stuff in here when it comes to a few of my mom's dishes. One of them for me is the mac and cheese. Somebody say amen. 
Mac and cheese will change your life. It comes out of the oven and she knows to set it down. John, John, it's ready. Give me the taste test. I happily come up there with my fork. I taste it while it's hot, burning my tongue and everything. I could care less. Put it in my mouth with my fork. You know, you know when you start dancing while you're eating? <laughs> it's good. And then my siblings will come in and they'll see me dancing with my fork. And like, John, John, you got that mac and cheese out? You got that mac and cheese out. Because I love my mom's mac and cheese. And when I had moved out of the house and started doing things on my own, I wanted to remake it. Because of my previous experience that made me dance, I said, I got to make me some mac and cheese. I did what I thought she did. Now, she has the mighty hand, but I took it on my own and I put my own thoughts together based on a previous experience. That mess came out the oven, that mess came out the oven. I put it in my mouth. Ain't nobody dancing. I said, man, I ain't do this right. Now, I had high expectations because I thought I knew. But I had a low experience because I didn't know. And so what I did was I got smart. I said, Mom, I tried to make you mac and cheese on my own. Didn't work out that well. Let me hold on to that recipe real quick. Let your boy hold on to that. Now, she does it in her head because it's been so long. But she went ahead and wrote out the recipe for me. I took that recipe, and when I tell you because I tried it on my own and it was gross, oh, I didn't move from that recipe to the right or to the left. I stuck to it. And when that stuff came out of the oven, I was dancing again. And you want to ask me what it means to live under the rule of the recipe? My answer is always going to be about the precision of the taste. Ain't nothing wrong with the recipe no more. I thought I could do it on my own, but I realized that it was the recipe that actually set me free to experience the taste. Now, I don't use the same tools. She liked to use her hands and grade the cheese. I ain't doing all that. I'm gonna go buy me some grated cheese. She wanna use her hands and whisk it like this. Forearms just burning. I tried it. Forearms just burning. I ain't doing all that. And because we got new tools. I don't care what your tools are. Tools may change, but the recipe better stay the same if you want to do your dance in your promised land. He says, what does it mean? What does it mean to live your life under the rule of God? God owns your life. And to give your life to anything else is only to experience a taste that you don't like. I've been in counseling sessions with my dad, not y'all's. Uh, you in my business with? Just certain invited ones. And as I was thinking about this message, I realized that he basically says one thing. Whether it's marriage, whether it's anxiety, depression, addiction, debt. He, pro he gets questions, probes questions. He pulls things out. And then he lays out on the table areas that are not submitted to God's word. Yes. And at that moment, that he lays it out in such a way that that person goes, ooh, I didn't think about that. I didn't see that. And they're already doing this before he starts giving his, his, his critique. They're saying, I already know. You know when you know where the preacher's going? I already know what time it is. And in one way or another, he says, you got to submit your life to God. Because the Bible tells you how to get out of debt. The Bible tells you how to heal your marital situation. The Bible tells you when the husband's out of line, when the wife is out of line. The Bible tells you what to, it tells you what to do. And so in those sessions, he's going to probe, 
find, pull out, show, and then tell you to submit your life to God. Because you want to change your experience. And what we do is we go to our own hand in order to produce that change. It says right here, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, but God brought us out with a mighty hand. The, the mighty hand of God. He told the people, put blood on the doorpost. And the Passover, Exodus 12 12 and 13, death is going to come, but if you have blood on that doorpost, it's going to pass over you. You say, that's Old Testament. No. It's a different half. It's the same game. It's the same mighty hand of God, Colossians 1.20. You have been reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. So you put blood on the doorpost and death has, you have been taken off of hell's doorstep. That is the same mighty hand of God. Moses came and he showed the people that he was sent from God because he did all of the plagues and the miracles. Jesus came and he showed the people that he was sent from God as God himself because he did all of the miracles. He's letting you know who he is. He's the one to deliver you. He's letting you know, I am the one with the mighty hand. I mean, he, he reconciled you to God in an instant because of his work. He, he became a man and took on the limitations of man and let people that he created crucify him in order for you to be saved. That is a mighty hand of God. He lived a perfect life so that you can trust him and therefore share in that perfection so that you can be acceptable to God, both able to be reconciled to him now and to walk into his house later. That is the mighty hand of God. So how can his hand be that mighty to take us off of the doorsteps of hell to reconcile us to a holy God, write the law on your heart in an instant. But he can't get you out of debt. He all of a sudden is going to struggle to help you out in your circumstances and situations. He, he doesn't have a mighty hand when it comes to bringing you your peace and your joy. I don't, I don't understand how that works. We leave his mighty hand to do it on our own. But we believe his mighty hand has the power to save us. And then we have this other experience because we have submitted ourselves to a whole nother kingdom. And kings have outcomes for their kingdom. So if you make something else your king, you will experience that particular king's outcomes. Even if you've been set free. That's why Galatians 5.1 says, it is for freedom that you have been set free. Therefore, never again return to the yoke of slavery. All you got to do is say verses backwards and you get them. You know what that means? That means that there is a yoke of slavery that you can return to even if you've been set free. And how we keep going from 43 to 86 as we submit our lives to God so that it can be for our good and our survival as it is today. How do you go forward in your marriage? We submit our lives to God because it's for our good and our survival. He has a promise for us. He brought us together. We, we, we made vows that, that God got it right. So then he can't be un-God and get it wrong. We, we have to submit our lives to God. This is how, there's no magic trick. I'm just drawing this out for my dad's sake. <laughs> but let me show you, the, the people of Israel, did, they went slaves in Egypt, right? Then they were free. Okay. Slaves. 
were free. Judges 2.10, there grew up a generation that did not know the Lord or the work that he had done. See, it's about that work. They didn't know what happened back then. They were raised in the promise with a silver spoon in their mouth. And so following God when you have a silver spoon in your mouth seems like a restriction. You don't realize it's freedom unless you know about Egypt. They ain't know about Egypt, so they thought, why are we doing this? So they went from slavery to freedom to Judges 21-25, and they did what was right in their own eyes. You know what happened after that? 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar and his boys showed up. They slaughtered southern Israel, Judah, and took them boys into captivity for 70 more years. And God allowed it. Why? Because you wanted to do what's right in your own eyes, even when you had been set free from former slavery. So you've been set free, now you're back in captivity. Why are you back in captivity? Because you're doing what's right in your own eyes. So you got all the prophets telling you, man, we're getting slaughtered. We're, things are bad, things are happening, but something else is coming so we can be set free again. And now we need to employ Nehemiah and Ezra. We need y'all real quick because we need y'all to help us rebuild. But it was already built. And it got torn down because you opened yourself up because you're doing what's right in your own eyes and you had already been set free from a former slavery. But now you got to go rebuild your life because you're in captivity for 70 years because you did what's right in your own eyes even though you had already been set free by a mighty hand. But you chose to use your hand. So now you're enslaved again and now your life is broken down and now you got to find some people to help you go rebuild it when God had already built it. It's the progression of the people of Israel and it's Old Testament. No, that sounds like my testament. It's the answer for every generation. Because even after his mighty hand, we go back to our own hands. And I've realized over time and, and people in my life having to look at me crazy. And my life being broken down and then having, okay, let me put the pieces back together. Hey, man, it was already built. Stay there. <laughs> it's already good. It, it's for your survival and for your good. I just want you to let you, I just want to let y'all know, this is like for y'all. <laughs> I mean, some people don't do it like it's against them or like it doesn't benefit. This like benefits you. My, my son Camden, I know I pick on Camden, but Camden's my boy. He's, we were, I took them to Padre l last week. I just drove down there with all five kids. Lord. <laughs> that was a vacation for them. We didn't, <laughs> me and Kanika were just like, oh, we're trying. And Camden was out on the beach and he was playing and his little sister Kyler threw sand in his eyes on accident. And so he came running over, dad, dad, my eyes, my eyes, my eyes are hurting. My eyes are hurting. I said, Camden, I had a bottle of water. I said, open your eyes. I'm going to pour some water in it. It'll wash the sand out. He said, no, that's going to hurt. <laughs> in my mind, I was thinking, you sorry joker. You already hurt. I'm trying to make this better for you. And he's like, that's going to hurt, that's going to hurt. And while he was hurting, he still had the fear of trusting. I'll leave it like that. I, I, can't, I can't do it. I said, son, I have water. Water is a cleansing agent. He's five. I'm trying to figure out how to tell him. I'm going to pour this in your eyes, and it's going to help get the sand out. He said, dad, it's going to hurt, it's going to hurt. So I... Put the bottle tap, uh, a cap back on the bottle. And I just went and sat down. I, I mean, I can't. So I just let Camden run around the beach in his slavery. I just.
Uh, uh, Y'all are getting a sense of how I parent. I just figure it'll teach you. Uh, You get to decide how long you want to run around this beach with your eyes hurting. I mean, and then eventually he said, okay. Because you ran out of options. And because you ran out of options in your pain, you tried everything else. Now it's okay. But then his fear built back up again. And he said, Dad, I, I can't do it. I said, I said, well, what you can't do, son, is use your hands. And he said, I, I can't do the water. And he did it. Shoop. He had been playing in the sand. His hands are dirty. So he tried to bring freedom to his eyes by using his own hands. And all he did was stick more dirt in his eyes and then start running around the beach again. I screwed the bottle cap back on and sat back down in my chair. Some of us actually think we can bring cleanliness and freedom to your life with your hands. You don't realize how how dirty your hands are? You've been playing in the sand so long and then you getting stuff all in your eyes and in your experience and in your life and in your finances and in your marriage and all of this stuff is going on and God is saying, I got the living water for you. I I, I got it for you. Open your eyes so I can pour it in. No, I don't trust you. I'm hurting too bad. All right then, have it your way. Keep on running around the way you want to run around. Keep on doing what you want to do until you decide to open your eyes to let him pour that living water in. You'll just continue to live in the slavery you created with your own hands. Somebody better submit their life to God because God is the one who has your life. To submit your life to anything else is only to become enslaved to something that ain't got nothing for you. So how long do you want to run around that beach? How long do you want to stay in captivity? He says, there is a question that's coming. There's a pre-prescribed answer that's already given. He has a mighty hand. He brought me out in order to bring me in to a promise that he has for my life. It is for my good and my survival as it is right now. So it is only right for me to obey God. It is only right for me to trust God. How do I obey God? You love him. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will do what I say. You say, that's the New Testament. I can go back to the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter six. Love the Lord your God with all of your If you love me with all of you, you will obey me with all of you. Don't tell me you love me, but you won't obey me. How do we reciprocate love to God? Not through saying, I love you. Everybody does that. The only way you can reciprocate love to God of what he's done for you is obedience. And until you obey, you cannot be set free even when you've been set free. Time's up, I'm done. Y'all can stand to your feet. Happy anniversary to the church. And I'm thankful uh, for my dad and my mom and the elders and all of you. Um, for not only being members, but being participants uh, for all of these years. If there's anyone, as we close, that just needs prayer about submission, because it was an easy concept to hear, but it's totally another ball game when you go back home to the mess and you have to do it. And everything in you wants to use your hands. So if you need prayer today, just purely on submission to God so that you can experience the freedom that God has for you, just come on up and we'll pray for you. Uh, We would love to do that. That's really all of us in some kind of shape, form, or fashion. (laughs) But if there's a specific need that you have, um, 
and you want to make sure that God is not sitting down waiting on you. Come on up. Bless you. Bless you. We're going to wait. There's a few more people coming. Nobody moving just for a second. And I'm going to ask that my dad be given a mic and come up here to the front. And he's prayed for me and it's worked for me. And I want him to pray for you. Father, I pray for these who've come forward, whether for salvation or for a recommitment of their lives, set them free with your mighty hand. Thank you for what we heard. Thank you for what you're going to do with what we heard. And we will give you the glory for what you're going to do in these lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you go over here and let us pray with you personally, right to the top of the steps there? We have someone who wants to pray with you personally 